Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Learning Theater presentation titled Enhanced Performance of the Notify XL2 Blood-Based Lung Nodule Test Through the Notify Lung Integrated Testing Strategy. My name is Ravi Lunt, and I'm a Senior Manager of Strategic Marketing at Biodesics. It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Susan Garwood. Dr. Garwood completed her internal medicine training at Vanderbilt University and her pulmonary and critical care training at the Medical University of South Carolina. She practices advanced bronchoscopy at Centennial Thoracic Surgical Associates in Nashville, Tennessee, and serves as the Thoracic Oncology Medical Director in the HCA TriStar Health Division and as the National Physician Director for the Pulmonary Service Line for the HCA Enterprise. Dr. Garwood is also an early adopter of the Notify Lung Testing Strategy. In today's presentation, she will share new data from three posters being presented here at CHEST, as well as Notify case studies from her own practice. We'll be leaving time at the end for a Q&A session, so please use the chat box to enter questions at any point throughout the presentation. And without further ado, Dr. Garwood. Thank you so much, Robbie, and thank you all for joining us today. Hopefully everybody can hear me okay. If you're anything like me, lung nodule management remains a frustrating algorithm of when to act and when to follow. My goal with nodule management is to try to find lung cancer early. If we look at our lung cancer, lung cancer statistics, we know that late stage diagnosis is still far too frequent. Today, I hope to share with you a confident path forward utilizing the Notify Lung Integrated Testing Strategy. Next slide. If you will look at the agenda, today we will cover challenges in nodule risk assessment, the Notify CDT test development and data, the Notify XL2 test development and data, and then to me the most exciting portion of this, which is the combined testing strategy. We will review clinical experience with the test, some new data on integrated testing strategy that Robbie shared with posters from CHESS, end with some case studies from my clinical practice, and also some Q&A. So let's dive in. This represents a day in the life of my um, everyday management. The scan to the left shows a 28 millimeter solid nodule in the left upper lobe. The scan to the right shows a nine millimeter, less ominous looking nodule in the lower lobe. Though I don't give you any clinical data about these patients, specifically their smoking status or their age, think about in your mind, what would you do? CT surveillance, PET scan, biopsy, or surgery? This is something we're faced with every day. If you're anything like me, the scan to the left, I favor looks malignant. It's large, it has borders that look concerning and it's in the upper lobe. The scan to the right is smaller, lower lobe, and obviously the borders look a bit smoother. Next slide. If we look at what actually happened to these patients, next slide. If we look at what happened to these patients, we see the CT scan on the left, that 28 millimeter nodule resolved completely. And the scan to the right actually, after 28 months of, um, after 28 months after initial detection, the nodule showed progressive enlargement and was ultimately resected to reveal a stage 1A adenocarcinoma. Both of these show, highlight the fact, pardon me, both of these highlight the fact that while clinical factors are important, they do not always tell the complete story. In both of these situations, additional information would have been a useful, useful adjunct to inform the diagnostic plan. Next slide. So let's talk about nodule risk assessment. If we look at incidental nodules themselves, they represent about 95%, okay? Our screening population represents only 5%. A recent study showed that two thirds of these nodules are actually lost to follow up for various reasons. And this in and of itself is an important thing for us to cover today. For those who are found in WorkSAP, we utilize radiographic factors as well as the patient's clinical factors in order to decide their pretest probability of malignancy. These specifically include things like age, the nodule size, its borders and location, combined with any cancer history in the patient smoking. If we look at ACCP guidelines for solitary pulmonary nodule evaluation, you can see that both the top and the bottom give very clear and straightforward paths. If you are high risk, it recommends proceeding to biopsy and ultimately surgery or intervention if needed. 
If you're in the very lowest risk group or less than 5%, CT surveillance can confidently be recommended. The issue is, is that 72% live in the middle. We consider those the indeterminate ones. This leads to great ambiguity. Some patients may move on to procedures that they don't need. Some patients may be moved into CT surveillance delaying diagnosis. If we think about the way we set up programs, we wanna make sure, number one, that we're capturing as many patients as we can and that we're ensuring that they get evaluated. As you build your funnel of incidentals and screening, utilizing Notify can be an important differentiator for your program, specifically in this middle ground of patients. Next slide. So what does that look like? A blood-based testing strategy can improve patient care. Specifically, the Notified Lung Testing Strategy has two specific platforms. The first listed to the left is a rule-in version of a nodule, um, a nodule risk assessment. That's the Notify CDT test. This is a blood-based antibody assay that helps identify lung nodules that are likely malignant. That 98% specificity gives you added confidence in the test with a 78% positive predictive value. The second test, the Notify XL2 test, is what I would consider a rule out test. It has very high sensitivity at 97% and an excellent negative predictive value at 98%. This is a blood-based assay that can help identify those that are likely benign, again, that we would move forward to CT surveillance. Next slide. So what does this look like whenever you get a report? What we want is to see what happens pre and post test. The notified lung ideally will identify those at higher or lower risk following the clinical testing. This is that above and beyond clinical factors alone. It highlights the pretest risk of malignancy utilizing clinical factors alone from the Mayo nodule calculator. Those are those five things that we spoke about before, specifically age, uh, size of the nodule, location, patient smoking history, and any cancer malignancy. The post-notify risk of malignancy takes into account those factors, as well as the serum biologics that we will speak about today to give you a post-test personalized risk of malignancy. In this specific example, the pre-test probability was listed at 12%. Following notify, there was a high level of autoantibodies detected, pushing this patient's post-test risk of malignancy to 66%. Again, by ACCP guidelines, we should act and proceed with biopsy even up to a surgical wedge if needed. Next slide. The Notify XL2 test is structured in much the same way. In this example, the pretest probability risk is 40%. Again, my uncomfortable area with how to proceed. Post-test, the, uh, the post-test risk of malignancy is 4%. Again, likely benign, giving you that confident path forward to know that CT surveillance is appropriate. So let's keep these two scenarios in mind as we move forward and dive in deeper into what these tests actually represent and their makeup. Next slide. We're gonna start with the CDT, CDT Notify test. Next slide. This test helps identify patients for whom intervention is recommended. And we're specifically gonna talk about this test first. It was initially developed with six autoantibody panel that you may remember um, under the name Oncommune at its original release. It has subsequently been revised uh, to optimize specificity. They actually removed two of the antibodies highlighted in red, and they added six autoantibodies. They, I'm sorry, they added three new autoantibodies. In its newest form, Healy et al. reported a 98% specificity for those that had a high level of autoantibodies detected, and a 93% specificity for those that had a moderate level. Again, an excellent rule in test. Biodesic conducted a retrospective analysis utilizing the Panoptic trial. The results of this retrospective analysis confirmed the previously reported performance of Notify CDT by Healy. If we look at the poster outline itself, it starts with 317 samples that were available in the Panoptic study for analysis. Of those, 263 of them met the CDT intended use criteria. 13% of those turned out to be CDT positive. When we looked at the percentage, that represented 74% of these nodules were malignant, leading to a 93% specificity and a 74% positive predictive value. This shows the necessary um, findings that we need to accurately identify patients that are likely malignant that may benefit 
from more um, invasive intervention. And again, this is consistent with, with, with what Healy found. Interestingly, if you look to the right, three patients with malignant nodules actually received a follow-up CT scan before diagnosis as standard of care in this group. If we had had the CDT positive result in practice, it may have led to a faster diagnosis, something I will highlight with a case study for my own personal practice next. Next slide. The eight millimeter nodules uh, shown here, uh, this is a 63-year-old female with a five millimeter nodule, which I detected, which um, a fellow pulmonologist detected on CT lung screen in March of last year. The follow-up low-dose CT scan in May showed slow growth to eight millimeters. That pulmonologist referred directly to our nodule clinic. If we look at this patient's history, if your patients are anything like mine, none of them are straightforward. This patient pretty much had every comorbidity that makes my job difficult. They had underlying severe COPD, including chronic hypoxemia. They had chronic pain and were on chronic narcotics. They had morbid obesity and underlying pulmonary hypertension, which had been treated and modified some with the use of CPAP uh, treatment and diuretics. The social history, they are an active smoker. We have excellent group of smokers in our, um, in our uh, area. She was at one and a half packs per day and had a 70 pack history. She did have a family history of lung cancer as well. Next slide. I identified her pretest risk of malignancy as 7% utilizing the solitary pulmonary nodule calculator. And to the right, you can see the small nodule there in a difficult biopsy location still in the lower lobe. Next slide. I proceeded with the notified lung testing, and this identified a moderate level of autoantibodies, suggesting that her post-test risk of malignancy was actually higher than anticipated at 16%. Next slide. This led to continued evaluation of the nodule. Again, this patient is very complicated with comorbidities. In a difficult biopsy procedure, I wasn't certain was warranted at this present time. Given the small size and the biopsy location, I recommended a three-month follow-up CT scan to further evaluate. When this occurred, her PET scan actually continued to reveal growth up to 10 millimeters, and there was no pedividity noted in this area. Again, I'm left with a difficult situation and now having to counsel the patient on what I think she should proceed with. Based on the slow interval growth and the fact that the notified tests returned positive for autoantibodies, I recommended intervention. We started with a surgical evaluation. Due to her pulmonary function testing and her comorbidities, she was felt not to be an ideal candidate, so she returned to me to discuss how we could approach this bronchoscopically. If any of you know, in large patients with comorbidities, especially in subpleural nodules that are small, this can be a difficult biopsy area. However, we were able to proceed successfully with robotic navigational bronchoscopy in this patient. Next slide. Robotic bronchoscopy revealed a well-differentiated pulmonary adenocarcinoma. I did stage her at the same time with no evidence of lymph node involvement. This resulted in a stage 1A, well-differentiated, PET-negative, slow-growing nodule. She was referred for SBRT due to her lack of surgical, um, due to the fact that she was not a surgical candidate. The Notify CDT test, I can confidently tell you, allowed me to counsel her about the risk versus benefits of proceeding in a timely fashion and ultimately ended up in a stage 1A diagnosis in a nodule one centimeter or less. That specific group is what we're trying to find. If you can find that patient population, the five-year survival rate has been shown to be up to 91%. So without this test, I really feel, given her comorbidities and other issues, I would have delayed further evaluation. Next slide. So let's look at the next part of the test, the Notify, CD, the Notify XL2 test. This test integrates proteomic insights with standard clinical risk assessments. It utilizes two specific plasma protein levels to help reclassify risk. The first is the LG3BP. This is a galactin-3 binding protein, and it's been found to be elevated in those with lung cancer. The second is the C163A, which is a hemoglobin scavenger receptor. This is shed in macrophages during inflammation. The specific ratio of these two factors if you look to the left in the pie graph, that ratio is actually equally weighted to the size of the pulmonary nodule. If you're anything like me, my first gut instinct is based on the size, like that first case presentation we saw. If it looks big and ugly, it has to be cancer. 
What I can tell you now confidently is the weight of this test with the size of the nodule holds equal weight and we should give them equal value. So what does this look like in everyday presentation? Next slide. The next poster presented, which I would encourage for you to review, looks at what I would call the pre-market and post-market performance of the Notify XL2 test. The panoptic subset, or pre-market, includes patients with a Mayo calculated risk of less than 50%. To the right is what we call the clinical use cohort. This is a group that uh, encompassed 1,000 consecutively ordered commercial tests following the launch of XL2. On the x-axis, we have the pre- and post-test results applying the integrated classifier. Again, that uses the pre-test probability along with the weighted uh, results of these two um, protein markers. In the in panoptic trial, you'll see on the left, 41% of the patients were able to be reclassified pre-market. Post-market, in a large cohort of 1,000 patients, we see validation of that with 43% of those patients being able to confidently be reclassified to lower risk. Reclassification of the risk is, to me, a very important. Again, we want to know when to act. The panoptic study concluded that there could have been 40% reduction in invasive procedures on benign nodules if this had been used in clinical practice. Ongoing clinical studies are going to look to validate this. Specifically, the Oracle trial will evaluate whether reclassification of risk indicates reduction in procedures on benign nodules in true clinical practice. And I can tell you I will review that here um, in my practice in just a moment to show you exactly how this can influence our practice. Next slide. So let's put this all together. How is this testing strategy used to reduce physician uncertainty and give a clear path forward? First of all, I want to remind you of the intended use for these tests. The patients must be over the age of 40. They have to have a nodule size in the indeterminate range, which we define as 8 millimeters to 30 millimeters. They have to have a solitary pulmonary nodule risk calculated score of less than 65% and no prior history of malignancy. The first strategy that's applied is the Notify CDT test. If moved to the higher risk group, a care plan is clear and straightforward. This answer comes back actually in one day. So it significantly reduces anxiety for my patients when I tell them, if you don't get a call from me in 24 hours, we know that that antibody test was negative. If the antibody test returns negative and their calculated nodule risk, a pretest malignancy risk is less than 50%, they're reflexively moved to the Notify XL2 result. This result comes back in one week's time, again, a fast turnaround time. And again, if we look at the data from Healy and from the cohort trial, we see that over 40% of the time, our patients can be moved to the CT surveillance group confidently. If they're in a reduced risk or indeterminate risk, it still remains up to multidisciplinary discussion and the, patient's, uh, and the physician's own clinical acumen using, in my case, oftentimes an MDM discussion and a PET scan to, to, guide, to guide further therapy. So let's talk about what it actually looks like in my practice, because to me, that's the most impactful thing anytime I hear a story is what does real world translation look like? So this is my experience with the XL2 platform. These plots review my 43 patients, the first 43 patients that I had in the intended use population. Two of them had moderate levels um, of autoantibodies, therefore they did not get reflex to XL2. Two of the patients actually had a pretest risk less than 5%. I ordered the test specifically to look at that CDT autoantibody part. When it came back negative, they were not reflex to XL2. That left me 39 patients. If you look at the post-notify XL2 risk of malignancy, you will see a large number of green dots below that 5% line. There are actually 20 patients that were reduced risk. That meant 51% of the time, I had a clear path forward in these indeterminate patients where I could confidently recommend serial surveillance. And I can confidently tell you that this led me to ordering less PET scans and less invasive procedures on these patients and move them to CT surveillance. The other important thing to know is this is not just novel to my talk today. Your biodefix representative can actually give this data back to you and provide clinical insight into your trends at any time. Outcome reviews such as this really allow you to highlight to referring physicians that you are using a comprehensive approach to nodule management. And again, I think this will dramatically improve the quality of your program. 
Next slide. So who did I utilize this test in? I utilized this test broadly in my practice as shown here. The top third actually reviews those 43 patients and shows the pretest probability of malignancy. If you look to the far right, eight of those patients, or 19%, were in a 40% or greater risk of malignancy. This is really my uncomfortable area. Do I truly watch and wait, regardless of the PET scan, or do I act now? The middle portion also highlights the nodule size, and like we've talked about before, the 8 to 10 millimeter range really is in another uncomfortable, uncertain area for me, and I tend to use this test quite heavily in that patient population. Remember, if we can find lung cancer smaller than a centimeter, the lives saved that we can um, incur is, is really dramatic, 91% survival at five years. So to me, this is the greatest opportunity, like we highlighted in the case report with that early stage find. The lower portion shows the variability in the patient's age, and to the right, you see some additional clinical factors, such as smoking status, um, speculation, again, um, showing the broad range of applicability of this in your clinical practice. Next slide. So to me, this is the most impactful poster, um, and I would encourage you to really to, to dig in, because this is what has guided the testing strategy moving forward. While panoptic to me was, was so exciting to see it come out, it reveals a substantial improvement in the identification of benign nodules. There still remained a reported 3% rate of malignant nodules that were inappropriately classified as likely benign. This panoptic subgroup analysis shows that if you had performed CDT first in those patients, the outcome of XL2 would have been improved. In this poster, it clearly shows that 0% of the nodules were 0% misclassification of nodules was found, allowing a confident path forward with serial CT surveillance in those very lowest risk groups. There were 150 patients in the Notify CDT intended use group that represented a 32% prevalence of cancer. Once CDT was applied, we realized that 134 of those patients were CDT negative. If we take out the 41 patients that were in the higher risk group, 50 to 65% risk, Remember, XL2 was not validated in that higher risk group. That left us with 93 patients. If you take that, you see that now we have a lower prevalence of cancer in this XL2 population, only 18%. Of those 93 patients, 41%, I mean, 41 of them, or 44%, actually were reclassified to the lowest risk of malignancy. After follow-up, we see that in every instance, this testing strategy was 100% accurate. All of the benign nodules that were classified were indeed benign, and 0% of nodules were misclassified as malignant. The nodules that would have been reclassified with Notify XL2, as we saw in the prior trial, would have been identified as positive by the Notify CDT testing strategy you see here. I'd also like to point out one additional area. If you look at those 41 patients that were benign, actually six of those patients had an invasive procedure as standard of care. This might have been avoided had this testing strategy been employed. Next slide. I'd like to highlight that specific point with a case study from my own practice. And again, I think this is something that, that we all can resonate with. This was a 14 millimeter speculated nodule that was located in the upper lobe. This patient was 57. He presented to the ER with atypical chest pain, which is a common presentation that will lead you to a CTA to rule out PE. During that process, this cavitary nodule was noted. We actually have an incidental nodule program that overreads all of our CT scans and feeds them to our nodule coordinator. Our nodule coordinator picked this up and coordinated with his primary care physician to refer him to our office. When I met him, I reviewed his clinical history, which you can see here. He, again, like my last patient, was a heavy ongoing smoker with a pack and a half a day with a 60-pack year history. So over 50, greater than 30-pack years, again, no family history of malignancy, but some cardiovascular risk. Next slide. When I looked at his pretest risk of malignancy, we saw it was quite high at 45%. And again, this is my uncomfortable area where I'm really uncertain on how to act. If we look at this nodule size, my go-to is often to proceed with the PET scan immediately as part of the evaluation, as part of the standard of care. Next slide. On his PET, again, I get an indeterminate result. 
moderate pet uptake with an SUV of 3.2. So the question is, how would you act with this result? I utilized the Notify Lung Testing Strategy, next slide, which showed that there were no significant level of autoantibodies detected. When his XL2 testing strategy was applied, it actually showed that he actually moved into the lowest risk group of likely benign with only a 5% risk of malignancy. Next slide. I can tell you what happened in real life is that the patient was anxious, I was anxious, my surgical partner was anxious that the test may not be valid. There's been a limited number of case studies and again, a limited use in our practice, so we weren't certain. We counseled the patient that the test results suggested that this result, that his nodule was truly benign, but due to his anxiety, they chose to move forward with the wedge biopsy. You can see the pathology here indeed revealed a wonderfully benign diagnosis. Both the low and high power views show the rim of a granuloma, giant cells, and chronic inflammation. This again was very reassuring for us and again an ongoing opportunity for us to counsel our patients with real world examples. Next slide. Today what I hope I've opened your mind to is the future of conf confident nodule management with the use of the Notify Lung Testing Strategy. The strength of the data and clinical experience continues to grow and Biodesics remains committed to moving the nodule management space forward for the positive outcome of all of our patients. I greatly appreciate your attendance today and I, I hope you found my cases compelling um, and the experience that we had in our office compelling as well. I look forward to answering any questions that you have. I know we have some kind of backed up in uh, our back pocket if need be, but uh, Robbie, are there any questions that have come forward? And um, please feel free, ask me anything you'd like. Yes, thank you very much, Dr. Garwood. And a reminder to everybody to uh, please submit your questions through the chat box if you have them. Um, also apologies for the technical difficulties in the presentation there. Uh, we'll be sure to follow up if anybody would like to see the images from the first case study that we were not able to present. So uh, first question for you, Dr. Garwood, is do you really find yourself changing diagnostic plans based on the test results? And how often does that happen? That's a great question, Robbie. So I think I can tell you when um, the test was first presented to me, um, I obviously had worked with Gerard Silvestri in my fellowship training. So obviously I have a lot of confidence in his, uh, his clinical acumen and expertise. So seeing him as a first author on Panoptic and looking at that result, I felt very good about acting in those with benign results moving to CT surveillance. The trickier portion for me came with the autoantibody test. So do we have enough clinical experience to guide me to act? And I can confidently tell you now, looking forward, I've had additional positive patients, all of whom have resulted in a malignancy diagnosis. And so uh, to me, more clinical experience truly guides me to act. And I can also confidently go back to my patients now and say, we have this large thousand patient cohort. We also had future ongoing studies. So to me, my own experience is my best advertisement to use this. And I can confidently say not just myself, but our multidisciplinary approach um, practice now uh, confidently moves forward with these results, whether it's the CDT result that's positive or an XLT test that tells us to wait. So I would say absolutely yes, this has been a game changer for us. Thank you. And, and another question here from the audience, um, how do you determine which patients to run the test on? Yeah, again, I think we want to harken back to the actual um, clinical indications. So this intended use population is a very important one. You may be inclined to use it uh, outside of the clinical use criteria. So we want to be very careful that we outline that and, and review that again. Specifically, it's for those aged greater than 40, who have a nodule size in between eight and 30 millimeters. And if you think about that, again, once nodule size gets larger, the once the patient gets uh, a very young patient, um, if a very young patient with a small nodule is likely to have a very low risk pretest probability, patients with a large nodule size who are older may be beyond that 65% risk calculation. So this is specifically meant for those who have a pretest risk less than 65% with the size and age criteria we uh, indicated and not having a cancer history in the past. So that's where I use it in clinical practice. Thank you, Dr. Garwood. Um, Sorry, another question here. 
Another question here from the audience, how widely available is this test in the USA and what is the cost to the patient insurance coverage? And I'd be exactly. happy to answer the second half of the question there. Yeah, so um, and, and perhaps maybe you can help me with the first. I would say that this is commercially available uh, to any ordering physician, and Robbie, correct me if I'm wrong, but anytime we have a new test, it's very important that you are keenly aware of what the cost to the patient would be. Um, so looking at the XL2 test, it is uh, covered by Medicare, um, so there's 0% out-of-pocket cost. If the patient is uninsured, again, uh, Robbie, you can probably speak to some of this, but we have financial assistance available for them where they disclose um, the indication, I have to disclose that I'm using it in the appropriate patient population. They then disclose their financials. The goal is to make sure that the out-of-pocket cost to each of our patients who use this is minimal. Robbie, any additional comments about um, payer mix and what's coming with, uh, with CDT and a comment about XL2? Yeah, absolutely. So um, as you mentioned, Notify XL2 is currently covered by Medicare and many private payers. Um, we're continually working on that. We have a fantastic reimbursement team um, that's always working to make sure that the impact to the patient is minimal. Uh, for the Notify CDT test, given that we just launched that, we're pursuing those coverage statements today. Um, but we do bill patients insurance companies um, for any test that's performed within the intended use population and uh, have a very robust financial assistance program to work with patients to make sure that their financial responsibility is minimal. And I think the most important thing, an explanation of benefits is uh, what we give our patients. So when I'm ordering the test, I review um, if there are any concerns, if they are a commercial payer or if they're a self-pay patient, I give them an explanation of benefits letter so that they know if they get a bill in the mail, their first call is to Biodesic um, Consumer Services to make sure and they will review. And I can confidently tell you, I have not had any patient uh, denied payment for this or had to have an out-of-pocket cost since I began using this. Our representatives are fantastic and wonderful advocates. We want to use this test in as many patients as, pos as possible because of the reasons we showed on the slides today. Excellent point. Uh, so changing gears a little bit, this question uh, from the audience, do you use it for ground glass nodules? Absolutely. So there's nothing in the specific parameters for size that tells you it has to be solid, semi-solid, or ground glass. So to me, the ground glass nodule is one of the most difficult, and the semi-solid nodule is very difficult. The nodule calculator only takes into account the size. But you can, as you're looking at it, your clinical acumen with the semi-solid nodule isn't nearly as heightened as something that is solid. So I think this test is ideally suited to help risk stratify those with ground glass nodules. Specifically, if you have an indeterminate PET scan as well, if you can confidently move them into a high autoantibody level or those with less than 5% risk, you have really made a dramatic impact on a ground glass nodule, which most of you know is left to watchful waiting for many years, uh, certainly many months, but in many years in many of our cases before a true biopsy or intervention um, is made. So I think it's ideally suited for those with indeterminate nodules, and there can be no more indeterminate nodule than one that's ground glass. Great question. Thank you very much. And we have one more, unless any others come in here in the last minute, um, which is, how would you recommend that one incorporate the tests if they're starting a new nodule program? I think the most important thing um, is that when you are seeing patients with nodules, specifically if you're launching a program for incidentals uh, or a screening program and you're marketing yourself as a lung nodule clinic, I can tell you what the referring physicians want is confidence in your management strategy. You're going to make them very um, perhaps distrusting of your management style if you're using testing that they are unaware of. So I can tell you that completely communicating with my referring physicians, speaking to large primary care groups, speaking to my group of cardiologists who refer a lot of um, incidental nodules. It's important to have education about what Notify is, not only with your patients, but with the referring physician. I specifically speak to my referring physicians personally when I order my first Notify test to let them know why this is part of my testing algorithm, how this will impact care, and what their patient may report back to them. When I initially see the patient in clinic, I've ordered the test, but the result is unavailable. So I let them know the timing of the test results. 
I let them know any billing concerns that I may have, and I let them know how I will plan to act. And I can tell you this level of intention when you are utilizing this in Nodule Clinic makes a huge impact and added confidence on your referring base. And I can tell you certainly garners me more consults and more referrals. So I would say education is key and any way you can do that with your marketing group within your practice or within your hospital to advertise a complete care evaluation will highlight you um, and be a true differentiator in the nodule field. Thank you very much, Dr. Garwood. And I think that will wrap up our program for today. So thank you everyone for your attention today. And thank you again, Dr. Garwood for the very informative presentation. Um, please stop by and, and check out the poster presentations that we'll have if you want to see additional data um, in addition to what Dr. Garwood shared today and stop by our booth to learn more about Notify. Thank Thanks you all so very much. Thanks so much, Robbie. Thank you all.